Anyway, if you ever looked at a screen during 2020, you probably saw this image. It's the Black Lives Matter mural in DC. And like many other things I start my videos with, I'll probably be talking about something else in like 30 seconds. For now, though, I want to talk about this mural, because it's one of the most obvious political stunts in recent years. Commissioned in June of 2020 by Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, the Black Lives Matter mural accomplished two things. It made Apple Maps briefly relevant again, and it set me on the path of writing a 20-ish minute video about political recuperation and Gramscian hegemony two years later. Other than that, not so much. Well, sorry, it did do one more thing. For Mayor Bowser, the mural was a very effective way to co-opt and neutralize Black Lives Matter without hearing any of the movement's demands, and actually giving herself the freedom to move in the complete opposite direction. I can't believe I almost forgot to mention that. Because at around the same time the mural went up, Bowser's proposals for 2021 included increasing police budgets and doubling the size of the cadet program. That is, when she wasn't busy spending time on TV proposing her, let's say, creative interpretation of what defund the police really means. You're gonna laugh, but I clearly misunderstood what defund the police meant the first time around. Oh man, I am embarrassed. Of course, the DC wing of BLM was quick to point out Bowser's hypocrisy and call the mural out for what it is, a pointless stunt. And they're right, but it's also a lot more than that. This mural fits into the more general topic of political recuperation and the idea of governing through consent. Let's do a video about that. Because the truth is that symbols like the mural and more generally quote unquote culture matter a lot in politics. Even though I had a lot of fun being a cheeky little guy and saying the mural didn't achieve anything, I only said that because, well, I wanted you to like me. And because I meant that it didn't help achieve the goals of the BLM movement in any way. In fact, it actively hid the betrayal of the movement's demands entirely. But it still mattered a lot as a cultural symbol, because ultimately, it was an integral part of the liberal co-optation of the Black Lives Matter movement and its watering down to a vague demand for recognition. It allowed Democrats like Bowser to remain as legitimate political figures in the public eye without actually representing the more radical wing of their electorate or carrying out its demands. In that sense, the mural did actually achieve quite a lot. In politics, this kind of co-opting and watering down of radical ideas is sometimes called recuperation. Okay, really it's only called that by this guy, Guy Debord, badass smoker and French philosopher of the mid 20th century. Who is this nerd? Well, he wrote a book, so now here we are. In his book, The Society of the Spectacle, and in the Manifesto for the Situationist International which he also wrote, Guy launches what academics call an attack, and what everybody else calls a couple paragraphs of words, on what he considers the new era of capitalism. Capitalism II, Consumerist Boogaloo. Following World War II, Guy became concerned with how his native France adopted consumerist culture, a society in which the solution to all the ills of modern life are channeled through the acquiring of mass-produced commodities. Guy described how, in the search for ever-growing markets, a society in which basic needs were generally met for most people turned to the consumption of not really necessary stuff. Buying not really necessary stuff became a new fundamental economic need, but also a basic human need. In a consumerist world, market actors and advertisers- The reason why you, unlike many other people, have this immediate negative predisposition towards NFTs is because NFTs are the final function of what we are talking about. NFTs are literally, quite literally, the, the last evolution of purchasing something that has no meaning other than what it signifies as you, uh, about you, the consumer. And in most circumstances, it doesn't even have any sort of like tangible product associated with it. There's nothing, no physical property associated with it. It's just simply numbers that say you own something that is easily replicable and that is created with the express purpose of being a speculative asset and nothing more. So that is not last, probably latest. I'm just saying that like, where can you go after NFTs? I don't even want to think about that because like what's, what's beyond a, what's beyond a, 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 Con a product that's not consumable you know what i mean where where there's nothing like there's nothing what what what, what could it be i guess virtual land uh, digital enclosures but that's you know and that's gonna happen but but i don't know i don't know what else you could do that is like that is less valuable that you associate value to with no fucking 
immediate tangible product other than the cultural signifier that you are wealthy and potentially you are going to make more money off of the thing that says you are wealthy. Advertisements are no longer trying to convince you to want the hip new FM radio. They are telling you that you need it in the same way that you need food on the table. In short, ads create new needs. Beyond this incredibly simplistic description of what advertising tries to do, however, Guy explains that it's not an actual belief in the need to own the latest piece of tech that motivates us to buy it. It's a need for the way these commodities make us look. In other words, appearances become essential to consumption, and by extension, to all of social life. It's all about appearances. Everything becomes about the spectacle. You need stuff not because you actually need it to live, nor do you need it because you're tricked into thinking you need it to live, but because you need to keep up appearances. It looks good to have stuff, and the specific stuff you have says something about you that you want others to know. Alright, big deal. So far we haven't really gone any further than your boomer dad talking about how dumb ripped jeans are. But for Guy, those jeans really do matter. Because not only are they, like other consumer products, capable of making us feel really bad, reduced to our appearances, and alienated from ourselves, but the philosophy of appearances that this image-based consumption cultivates ends up becoming a huge part of our society, and therefore, of our politics. For Guy, then, politics become dominated by how appearances are manipulated without substance ever really needing to support them. Today, the classic example of this is Donald Trump and how he convinced some 60 million people that a billionaire real estate mogul was somehow not part of the elite. He played on his appearance as an outsider to hide the reality of another political elite who would spend his time in office growing the power of his wealthy buddies with things like tax cuts for the rich. But even if he's the most egregious example of what Guy calls the spectacle in politics, the same framework of analysis applies to Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, who both challenge Trump mainly by cultivating their own image, that of responsible, level-headed politicians, instead of any meaningful contradiction to his policies, many of which still haven't been reversed since Biden took office. The same goes for every other politician, even the ones you like, and the same goes for every late-night show host who spent every minute of a four-year term on how dumb Trump's hair looked, or his daily outrageous tweet, far more often than on the policies he carried through Congress. This is what Guy calls the society of the spectacle, in which appearances take on this disproportionate influence and can come to replace the substance of material reality in many cases. But believe it or not, we haven't even gotten to the good part yet. We haven't talked about revolution. Because there's more to politics than politicians trying to get you to vote for them. There's also a bunch of people in power who benefit from the society of the spectacle and use it to make sure their power doesn't get wrestled away. Stephen Colbert did a lot of good critique of Trump's politics. Stop this meme. How do you find yourself in my community of all fucking places as a Stephen Colbert defender? How the fuck does that happen? I'm actually shocked. Like, I need to understand the journey that this motherfucker took to arrive here to be like, no, nah, actually, Stephen Colbert did really good critiques of Trump's policies. Like, no, he didn't. Like, he did not. Away from them. When yeah, I'm not talking about old Colbert. I'm talking about new Colbert, like late night Colbert, who sucks. The carrot went up too far. It hit the fucking brainstem, you know? Look, copious consumption is incredibly important for Americans, okay? Or, or incredibly important for most people existing under a capitalist society that's like our primary fucking function as a, as a labor force we're not even a fucking labor force but we're more so a, a consumer force right that's why uh when when uh covid first struck originally they had to fucking you know make sure that every every worker who stayed at home would be able to go purchase stuff you know what i mean because like that's really important so that the economy doesn't uh so that the economy doesn't blow up and most of that is just the cultural signifier uh, that is really important for people's uh, lives. And then you have the $5 a month subscription to the Hassan Abi broadcast. The dominant class is confronted with radical, subversive, or revolutionary opposition, movements like Black Lives Matter, for example. Using the power of appearances comes in really, really handy. That is recuperation. The ability for members of the dominant class to twist and appropriate revolutionary appearances for their own benefit. 
absorbing yep. revolutionary sentiments into their fold and ensuring their survival as the dominant class doesn't get challenged because they've neutered the radical content that those images used to communicate. In Guy's own words, the ruling ideology sees to it that subversive discoveries are trivialized and sterilized, after which they can be safely spectacularized. In the case of DC Mayor Muriel Bowser, her appropriation of the Black Lives Matter or defund the police slogans does exactly this and helps her achieve two things. One, it sterilizes the message. Defund the police is no longer about actually defunding the police, brain, silly. It's about reform, more training, and more money. Black Lives Matter is no longer about actually ensuring the value of black lives is respected by distributing wealth more equally, abolishing the violent carceral state and the militarized police, or ensuring that the institutions that guarantee a decent life are properly funded everywhere. Black Lives Matter is just about saying that black lives The anti-Colbert take feels like anti-work mod obliviousness of what works for the normies don't turn nihilist on us. I just despise you liberals, bro. I'm sorry. Like, I don't... I don't like you. Like, if you've been in here long enough and you're still, like, fucking uh, uh, taking, like, a stance like this, I just, I'm going to let you know, you're not a, you know, you're not in a, we're not ideologically aligned. I'm not a nihilist. That's fucking stupid. I mean, nihilism is, is almost inevitable for many people in, the, in this day and age, but I'm not. I'm just not a fucking liberal. Even Colbert is boring as fuck. He used to be really funny. He used to actually rip into he used to actually rip into conservatives pretty funny in a, in a really uh clever way stop turning away chatter scream at them or something re what his his comedy I suffered as a consequence of Jesus. of being like a fucking late night talk show he wanted to get the bag it's fine like he wanted to get the fucking bag and that's fine but don't come in here and fucking try to tell me like don't piss on my face and tell me it's raining because that's what you're doing right now. You're like, you're, you're literally like, no, it's just like, it's not enough that you don't care about Stephen Colbert, like, or you don't, you have to like Stephen Colbert. Like, you have to like him. What do you consider yourself? A socialist that lives in a $3 million mansion? The fuck? Yeah, I, I do, actually. I don't have to consider myself anything. I just consider myself to be considerate to your mom when I fuck her every night. And that's pretty much it. I consider myself not the stepfather, to not be the stepfather, but the father that stepped up matter and that's it it's literally just about the spectacle but that's not all the second thing this appropriation does is it provides a safeguard to her power and the power she defends that of a white supremacist nation that can only function with a heavily racialized distribution of property now that the radicality of the words black lives matter and defund the police have been completely neutralized bowser can use them all she wants and because she said the words, painted them on the street, and paid lip service to the movement, she can somewhat credibly position herself on the side of the revolutionaries while firmly maintaining the oppressive status quo they are revolting against, effectively killing the subversive movement. It's nothing more than a rhetorical trick. Guy Debord would say, Black Lives Matter. Not that I'm a like revolutionary figure or even a thinker, one of uh, many of these people from uh many of these historical figures but i did see karl marx's house in london it's pretty fucking tight pretty nice also had a big house to see not that i'm similar in any meaningful capacity i'm not a theorist i'm not a thinker i'm not a revolutionary i'm not a fucking leader i'm just a twitch streamer but you know i did see his house and it was pretty good you are definitely not a thinker yeah no i'm not i'm not a thinker has been recuperated this whole approach to government isn't entirely new Decades before Guy was born, another political theorist had figured out that culture was a major part of the ways governments and dominant classes self-preserve and govern. That guy is Antonio Gramsci, and he had an idea he called hegemony. For Gramsci, a leftist Italian revolutionary imprisoned under Mussolini, governments and dominant groups maintain their status in two big ways. There's the obvious one, the way governments have always run the show, violent coercion. Nice. Your armed nice. forces, your police nice. officers, your prisons, and all the laws and regulations that establish and enforce the rules of government above you. That's the obvious way that those in power stay in power. Nothing very surprising there. Gramsci's innovation, which has honestly lost a lot of flair after like 90 years, 
is that that violent kind of coercion is only being used to discipline people who don't consent to the way society is organized and to the rule of the powerful. The problem, for those in power, is that if too many people don't consent, and your only solution is beating up those people, you run the risk of starting a revolution. And then there are gonna be way too many people to beat up, and you might lose your beaten stick. So dominant classes don't just repress those who don't consent, they also use the domain of culture, what Gramsci calls civil society, to manufacture consent in the general population and suppress more subtly the kinds of thinking that may upset their interests. Media and political institutions, the vast majority of which are less accountable to the general population than to the financial interests that fund them, can serve as the means by which this consent is manufactured. It's not usually going to be done with outright lies, but with more subtle biases that frame stories a certain, at times, dishonest way, or focus on one issue while ignoring another, or transform the debate. Nothing will change with people, Hassan, not taking part in electoral pro politics, etc. Starbucks protests? What? Me as a poor man, I just, I just, you all the same, including Hassan, but I enjoy watching you. Debate or change the language with which. What they did with Martin Luther King now is just whitewashing and historical revisionism um which is uh basically the the older the historical version of what he's talking about which is just uh straight up co-opting it's a it's a little bit different because this is contemporary and happening right now okay what's happening right now is a little different what did they do eight can't wait was the immediate counter uh to the more revolutionary takes coming from the streets. Okay, my brother told me Joe Rogan will go down in history with thinkers like Marx and Plato. Says he's a modern philosopher. Dude, that's so sad, bro. To be honest, maybe it's true because we are collectively getting dumber and dumber and dumber, you know? It is understood. Or make it about something else. Or platform some people and not others. Ultimately, however that consent is manufactured, the main goal will be to present one narrative as dominant and most easily agreed with, and its contradiction, which could threaten established power, as disagreeable. The upshot, if you're one of these people in power, is that the more people speak in your terms and agree with the basic premises that keep you in power, the less you'll have to repress them with guns and barred windows. To be clear, all forms of media will have bias. There is no such thing as absolute neutrality in media, as I constantly tell people in the comments. The difference with manufacturing consent is that the assumptions that communicate bias aren't framed explicitly as such. They're presented as if they were common sense, or at least they're never explicitly challenged. The result is that that kind of bias can become almost imperceptible to a general audience when these unchallenged, mostly hidden biases are repeated across the entire landscape of the media we consume and in civil society more generally. This is cultural hegemony, the absolute and incredibly subtle domination of culture by one group. Guy called this the rigged arena of official culture and Gramsci's analysis uncovered its relevance and maintenance by the upper class, the state, and their institutions. Nowadays, it's not hard to see the constant debate of the phrase defund the police, three words which could not be easier to understand, participating in this muddying of the water and pacification of a more radical idea. This form of government, that operates through cultural institutions, sanctioned political debates, and the recuperation of subversive politics can have incredibly powerful consequences. Not only does it maintain the kinds of oppressive power structures that we all know and love from your classic capitalist society in the short term, it can create what another nerd calls capitalist realism. This is the last nerd, I promise. According to Mark Fisher, yet another political theorist, capitalist realism is the widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible even to imagine a coherent alternative to it. Capitalism becomes common sense. Here again, according to Fisher, the interests of businesses, which are usually framed as the interests of the economy, are so dominant in our culture that we come to accept true Hence why one can, in Hollywood, very easily imagine
the end of mankind. Ten months. And all we know, I have an addiction and rather an addiction. than imagine the end of capitalism. Truly horrible. Another Mark Fisher. I mean, I'm paraphrasing Mark Fisher, but that's the Mark Fisher quote. Easier to imagine the end of mankind than the end of uh, capitalism. Well, realities as inevitable and uniquely real. While the neoliberal era has produced endless suffering around the world, the possibility of global human annihilation by climate change, and countless wars and conflicts for profit, billions of people still justify the integrity of the global capitalist economy because it has become incredibly difficult to imagine an alternative. Hey, it might be horrible, but it's the best we've got. At least that's how we've come to rationalize it. And for that, we have to thank, at least in part, the persistent efforts of recuperation that have hollowed out even the most revolutionary of movements and made them agreeable to the persistence of a capitalist economy. In the neoliberal present, the only solutions that are considered valid and enter the public debate are those which merely oh, mitigate what capitalist societies portray as externalities of economic production. The problems of a capitalist society aren't really problems with capitalism itself, of course, just its execution. They're externalities, unintended consequences, nothing more. We're led to believe we can really fix these issues without challenging the overall economic order. But many of these issues are so intimately tied to the pillars that uphold capitalism that they won't go away without those pillars crumbling too. Under the logic of capitalist realism, there is no abolishing capitalism, or even considering that as an option when trying to solve its problems. The only legitimate way to quote-unquote solve climate change, for example, is staying squarely within market logic. Buying eco-friendly things, or watching your individual carbon footprint, or creating new carbon markets to try to gamify pollution. It's not that an economy that needs to grow endlessly forever and constantly deliver at least 3% gains to shareholders will inevitably extract more from the earth to produce more to sell more. It's just that you're not buying enough paper straws. Save the turtles, you selfish jerk. Under the logic of capitalist realism, entire alternative economic models are cast aside as utopian, as jokes, as impossible. You'll hear things like, how can you really defend communism? Don't you know every time someone tried it, it failed? But don't pay attention to all of its successes or the ways capitalist societies are failing you right now. Those we can actually fix. This economic model is different. It can actually achieve all that utopian stuff. The fact that it's dominated the global economy for centuries and these issues have only gotten worse doesn't mean anything. Trust me. Part of the tremendous power of capitalist realism is that it can exist side by side with the empty symbols that promote its abolition. And uh, looking a lot like socialism to me, brother. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, okay? Um, like this. New. A top suicide hotline is collecting data from people's darkest moments and sharing it with a for-profit company that is using the data to build and sell customer service software. Fuck yeah, baby. That's right. That's what I'm talking about, dude. That's what I'm fucking talking about, dude. This sounds a lot like socialism. It's something that have, would happen under socialism. Oh, wait, it's happening under capitalism. But, you know, it could be happening under socialism as well. And when it happens under socialism, it's the fault of the socialism, the system. When it's happening under capitalism, it's an individual actor that's individually being bad. And actually, you're individually at fault for, you know, wanting to die and then uh, allowing a corporation to Loving fucking give, you know, uh, to, to corporation to just take your fucking information and sell it to someone else. That's just the reality. That's why when 14 million people die of famine-related diseases in our capitalist, global, global capitalist organization of the economy, okay, because we do live under capitalism. There is no socialism anywhere, okay? Truth hurts, cope. Imagine the revolution if Rogan gets whacked like McAfee or something. You think what happens if Rogan is found dead? What do you think happens if... What? Truth hurts, cope. Dude... 90% of what you motherfuckers do in here is literally cope. Like, you haters come in here and you're like, I literally live in the shittiest existence. Like, homies will literally come in here and go, I live the shittiest existence, dude. And the one fucking dude who's like, hey, maybe it's not my fault. Maybe it's the system that is designed this way that's telling me that the system is designed against me. No, fuck that guy. That guy's at fault because he's living good. He's living cushy, bro. I don't want to fucking hear what he's saying. I'm just, that makes me even more mad. It's like, dude, you literally, you quite literally fucking uplift people like Elon Musk and then turn around and fucking yell at me, dude. Yeah, it's my fault, dude. I know. Anyway, what I was trying to say is uh, under a capitalist organization of the economy, 
famine and famine related uh, diseases uh, kill 14 million people, okay? 14 million people a year. And that is even weirder when you consider the reality that like uh, the only solution is logistical, okay? Like we already have a surplus of food. We, we create a surplus of food right now and 14 million people die of famine related diseases under capitalism. Who's at fault there? Motherfuckers who didn't bootstrap hard enough. Sorry, you fucking grew up in Ethiopia. Sorry, you were born in Yemen. Sorry, you were born in an African nation. Like, it does not matter. It's just you didn't bootstrap hard enough, okay? That's why you died of famine-related diseases. Um, or even if you're living in America and you died of fucking famine or, or you're food-deprived, that's still, you didn't bootstrap hard enough. And that's the attitude that we take. Stop being lazy, because everyone that died, all 14 million people that died under capitalist organization economy died because of their own individual failures. Everyone that dies under communism, okay, or a socialist uh, transitional state, okay, they, they all die because socialism. They all died of famine because socialism bad. So it's the very same problems that, they, that are persistent in every organization of the economy that uh, capitalists will, will turn into uh, agitprop against socialism. It will use against socialism as a talking point. to be like, yeah, no, it's actually fucking socialism that's like killing Endlessly co-opted movements for liberation become watered down until they're just prefixes or qualifiers for various parts of the capitalist economy. The way you'll often hear about green capitalism, rainbow capitalism, or black capitalism. Media like Squid Game or Parasite or Don't Look Up become that week's water cooler talk. Movements and phrases like Black Lives Matter. Wait, so what do you say to someone who tells you we can't use socialism because it never works? Do you just tell them that the outcomes of capitalism, climate change, war, destruction of third world countries are way worse than socialism, no consumerism, shitty Minecraft blockhouses? First of all, why the fuck does socialism mean brutalist architecture? Like, that does not, it's not real. It's not a real thing. Okay. And no consumerism? What the fuck are you talking about? There's like many different ways of giving workers uh, the, the means of production while simultaneously... Um, while simultaneously fucking uh, uh, allowing uh, people to consume whatever the fuck they want to consume. You're not going to get a fucking brutalist uh, Minecraft house, okay? I don't like brutalism either. Yeah, people saying brutalism is sick as fuck, watch your mouth. I don't like brutalism either. I'm not a fan. I don't like brutalist architecture, even though I almost lived in one of those box fucking houses in, in, uh, in West Hollywood. I personally believe that the neoliberal method of control, which is a necessity, like a level of control is a necessity. That's what governments do. And I think the neoliberal method of control is good. It is. Even if like all product is like centralized, uh, all product is being controlled in a centralized manner. Uh, and like uh, it's, it's, it goes far beyond agricultural subsidies and actually just straight up is like, this is how much fucking grain we have. This is what we're going to continue to do, which we have the mathematical capabilities of predicting by the way for the record for those of you who don't know for those of you who claim that like we do not have the computational power to figure out like exactly how much product is necessary uh you're wrong amazon does it every day and you know the entire infrastructure the the logistical uh part of amazon resembles an entire country a nation state uh so does walmart so uh you know chill the fuck out we do that uh, we could do that in the past too, unless you get some like fucking weirdo, a grain scientist like Stalin did, okay, and a whole bunch of other issues there, which I'm not going to get into. But anyway, we do this already. We do this centralized control already. But uh, what I'm trying to simply state is that like we can have that, we can have all of that, or we can experiment with uh, market-based, uh, market-based uh, economies that have full-blown control again centralized control still but the main purpose is offering people a base level of material equality so they can thrive okay hating brutalist architecture means you love homeless people leaving poop towels outside your house yeah i'm a big fan of that that's true may have become a fixture of our modern society but in many ways it's because they've lost a lot of their radicality not because they've been truly accepted or achieved any of their goals but because they've successfully been defanged by an advanced system of recuperation to not really matter or be perceived as an actual threat to the social order they challenged. I recognize that this video, like most of the videos on this channel, will is not be kind monetized. of doing the same thing. My job oh, is taking damn. some pretty radical I'm surprised. ideas. He always fucking says, will not be monetized. That's why I, 
<laughs> Normally he goes, that's why my video is sponsored by whatever the fuck his sponsor is. Dude, I love Second Thought. He is he's really good. And only getting better, honestly. His channel is is great. Been a big fan. And turning them into entertainment for you. Turning them into something that you can pretty passively consume. Sadly, these videos, Obvious. just like most everything else, are part of the spectacle too. We've never met, we're not actually communicating, and even if I think I'm doing a pretty good job, which I do, of course, I'm very full of myself, trust me, even if I think I'm doing a good job, I am still mostly talking ideas at you, not with you, and without an immediate or concrete plan in mind. As essential as I think what I'm doing is, I'm just one guy on the internet, and I hope that you will fill in the gaps and carry what you learn in these videos into the real world to actually improve things. Fight for change and make it reality. Otherwise... Do you agree with him that leftist media can only neutralize radicalism? Um, I don't know what he means by leftist media. I think the most we can do is agitprop. That's it. There's nothing else that we can do. That's what I always say. I always say I'm a fucking Twitch streamer. Like, I'm not your... I'm not your savior, okay? Only you can save yourself. Only... Only collective action can save you, okay? And the best I can do, the most important thing I can do, I'm not like some fucking dumb lib, okay, who, who runs around and says things like, oh, I don't know why you don't just, like, fucking use your wealth to go and, you know, fund a project or a super PAC. Like, what the fuck? Uh, like, that stuff is, that's shits for the birds, okay? The only thing I can do for you is one help you better communicate why you are angry and the way you feel the way you do okay 13 months later. that's the only thing i can do is like help you communicate your desires better and help you fucking recognize why you have a shitty hand dealt to you but you have to then turn around and tell that to others you have to turn around and organize on your own that's just how it happens there's no other way to do that. Percent, when are you going to acknowledge my degeneracy? Don't use your wealth, use your platform. No, like, the, the, my wealth is nothing in, in the grand scheme of things. Especially when the entire system is completely fucking built up against it. Like, it's so stupid. It is literally, it is quite literally, okay? It is quite literally the exact same energy as Republicans whenever people do this. And I do do this. I do help. I do help where I can. So it's really stupid, okay? But not only that, but holy shit, scum of the swamp. Thank you for the 50 gifted subs. But I do help where I can, okay? Mutual aid is, is great. It's unfortunately a band-aid, but it's a, it's a necessary one, unfortunately, okay? But what I'm trying to state is that I, I got nothing. You know, uh, like there is no, even one billionaire doesn't have enough uh, power and influence uh, to, to magically turn this into a socialist utopia. They don't because the entire system that is designed to create billionaires is designed against that mentality. We are living in a capitalist organization of the economy. So that's the reason why I can uh, be this major hypocrite that lives in a fucking, you know, seven grillion dollar mansion and still have more Marxist Leninists in here watching me than any other fucking leftist streamer. Unless they're, you know, quite literally Marxist Leninists with their own version of a podcast that want to claim that they're Marxist Leninists, but actually, never mind, they're just patriotic Americans now. Never mind, they're no longer communists, actually. Uh, they're, they're just straight up, uh, you know, reactionary Republicans that say that they're leftists, the real leftists. You know, everyone's done that already. The point is like, dude, I don't understand how you're not like literally fucking changing. I, I, you're not changing and turning this into a socialist uh, version of the economy. Uh, what the fuck is wrong with you? Um, the reason why uh, I, I immediately like laugh against that, even though it's fucking bad marketing on my end, it's bad PR for me to laugh against that and, and not take it seriously, um, is because it has the exact same energy... Literally everyone in every leftist her circle hates that guy. The reason why uh, I, I laugh at that is because it has the exact same energy as like, hey, oh, uh, you want to fucking solve immigration, dude? Oh, why don't you fucking house an undocumented immigrant? Uvuzela. <laughs> like, leftists love doing that from the left. Like, there's a lot of people who claim that they're leftists with no theory-ass motherfuckers, uh, with no theory-ass uh, brains that just say... 
like oh you want to fucking solve uh you, you want you want more immigrants here why don't you house them so stupid